Today, we're brushing off the dust of forgotten tales, plunging into the core of these unsettling events. Welcome to another episode of Unfolding History, where we dissect the past to comprehend the complexities of our present. Today, we're unearthing the chilling tale of the Taos Revolt of 1847. It's a quiet morning in the New Mexican town of Taos. The air is crisp and cool, and Governor Charles Bent can hear the crunch of approaching footsteps outside his bedroom window. Then comes the sound of angry, drunken voices. They grow louder and louder, rising together in a war song that shatters the stillness of the land. Governor Bent starts to rise from his bed, but the men outside are impatient. Alcohol has mixed with years of resentment and driven them into a frenzy. They start pounding on his front door with their fists. Some of them climb up onto the roof. They continue shouting at him until he finally shuffles out, still dressed in his bedclothes. What do you want? He shouts. We want your head, replies the mob. We don't want you to govern us anymore. As Governor Bent looks out at the angry mob, he sees they are a group of Pueblo Indians, many of whom he has known for years. Not realizing the danger that he's in, he tries to talk to them, but they're not interested in talking. Instead, they draw back their bowstrings and release a volley of arrows. Three of the arrows lodge themselves in the governor's face, and he staggers back through the front door, bolting it after him. With three arrows sticking awkwardly out of his face, he resembles a pincushion, but he has no time to attend to his wounds. Now that blood has been drawn, the mob turns into a hurricane, shattering windows all around the house and pounding on the roof. At this point, Governor Bent has little time to think about anything but the immediate survival of himself and his family. If he had had time to reflect, he might have longed for the comfort of the previous evening, which he spent warming himself by the fireplace with his wife and children. Or he might have felt regret creep in, the regret of returning to Taos without the protection of soldiers, or of being chosen as governor of this poor, hostile territory. But Governor Bent had no time for any of that. He had little time for anything. Soon he would be dead, and the raging crowd would spread through the rest of New Mexico, swelling in size and killing any American they could find. This was the beginning of the Taos Revolt of 1847, a terrifying outpouring of violence and hatred that swept through the valleys and hills around Taos and threatened the United States' precarious hold over the newly occupied territory. From Charles Bent's gruesome assassination to the final slaughter of the Pueblo Indian rebels by the US military, the Taos Revolt threatened the very fate of New Mexico and reminded everyone that in the crucible of the American Southwest, old hatreds always lurked just beneath the surface. Sometimes all it took was a spark to turn that hatred into violence. The Taos Revolt began on January 19, 1847, but its roots stretched back much further. Just weeks before, Governor Bent had discovered a Mexican plot to rise up and kill all of the Americans in the territory. Fortunately for Bent, a local tavern owner tipped off the Americans about the intended revolt, and the Mexican ringleaders were promptly rounded up and captured. Governor Bent and his colleagues congratulated themselves afterwards for stopping what could have been a bloody uprising, but they were a little too confident. You see, in New Mexico, peace was often an illusion, and if they had paid attention to the signs, they would have known they were still in grave danger. The thing is, New Mexico had always been contested land. The region had belonged to Mexico ever since they gained their independence from Spain in 1821. Before that, it had been part of the far-flung Spanish Empire, with Taos representing its northernmost tip. At least, that's how it would have looked on maps drawn up by Europeans. In reality, the territory was controlled by the Comanches, whose own empire stretched from the Great Plains down into northern Mexico. The Comanches had terrified the Spanish for centuries, forcing them to stay within the walls of their heavily fortified forts, known as presidios. The Comanches' superior horsemanship and fighting ability meant that no Mexican, Spaniard, or American stood a chance against them on the open plains. Besides the fearsome Comanches, there were the Navajo, Apaches, and Kiowa, all of whom had lived for centuries alongside the Spaniards in a pattern of conflict, cooperation, and uneasy truces. But in 1846, everything changed when the United States went to war with Mexico. That summer, in the midst of what became known as the Mexican-American War, General Stephen Kearney arrived in Santa Fe with his Army of the West and declared it a possession of the United States. After marching into Santa Fe unopposed, Kearney proudly wrote back to his superiors, claiming that he had achieved his victory without firing a gun or spilling a drop of blood. But the blood would come later. The arrival of American soldiers suddenly made a volatile situation even more untenable. Mexicans and Indians, who had lived and traded with Americans for decades, quickly came to resent their occupiers, who swaggered drunkenly through the streets, harassed locals, and insulted their darker-skinned neighbors. The newcomer Americans made no effort to hide their contemptuous views of the local Mexicans and Indians, who they considered children incapable of governing themselves. And it was not just the soldiers that the locals resented. Even Charles B 
Bent, who had lived in Mexico for 10 years, became a target of their hatred. You see, Charles Bent had never really fit in with the rest of the community. He was married to a Mexican woman, yet he held racist views toward Mexicans in general. He also refused to join the Catholic Church, which didn't sit well with the heavily Catholic population of New Mexico. Finally, through his commercial ventures, he had sold guns to the Comanches, whose raids against Mexican farmers continued to spread terror throughout the borderlands. For all of those reasons, Charles Bent was not a wise choice for governor of New Mexico. But once Stephen Kearney was convinced that he had secured the territory, he set off for California, where he was eager to continue to conquer more Mexican lands. In his place, he set up a government with Charles Bent as the man in charge. It would not be until four months later that Stephen Kearney would come to realize his error. By that time, Charles Bent would be dead, and the whole of New Mexico would be caught up in an orgy of violence. Here's how those events unfolded. Charles Bent had arrived in Taos the day before the mob showed up at his home. He had come from Santa Fe with five other travelers that included Sheriff Stephen Lee, Circuit Attorney James Leal, a relative named Cornelio Vigil, and two teenagers, one of whom was his wife's younger brother. By the end of the first day of violence, all of them would be dead. The revolt was sparked by what the Pueblo Indians saw as the unjust imprisonment of three of their companions, who had been accused of stealing. As the governor rode into town that first evening, a crowd had surrounded him and demanded that he release the three men at once. The Indians were drinking whiskey and shouting. They blocked his path and began accosting him. But the governor pushed through, eager to get home to his family. He had experienced the dark stares of locals in every town he had passed through on his way from Santa Fe, and this seemed no different. He told them there was nothing he could do and that it was in the hands of the legal system. The next morning, a crowd gathered outside the Taos jailhouse, where the three Pueblo Indians were being held. The sheriff was there along with Cornelio Vigil, and the crowd quickly surrounded the two of them, demanding once again that they release the prisoners. The sheriff, seeing that he stood no chance against the armed and angry mob, was about to give in when Cornelio Vigil stepped forward to stop them. The crowd immediately pounced on him. They cut him to pieces and then stormed the jail and freed the prisoners. Fired up, the crowd then moved on to Governor Bent's house. After being shot in the face with arrows, the governor barricaded himself in his adobe home alongside his wife, children, Indian servant, a friend named Rumalda Boggs, and Bent's sister-in-law, who happened to be the wife of Kit Carson. While Bent tried to placate the crowd by offering them money and amnesty, the women took hold of soup ladles, silverware, and whatever else was at hand, and started scraping at a back wall in an attempt to escape to an adjacent adobe building. Just as they were finishing their tunnel, the attackers broke into the house and struck the governor with two more arrows. Badly wounded, he threw himself onto his hands and knees and tried to crawl his way through the opening in the wall. But the arrows still sticking out of his face made it impossible. He paused just long enough to rip them out and then pushed himself through to the other side where his family waited for him. Once on the other side, he tried to scribble out a note, but before he could finish, his pursuers made it through the tunnel. With his family looking on in horror, they shot Governor Bent in the chest several times. Still alive, one of the attackers came forward and scalped him with his bowstring. According to Rumalda, his skin cut as cleanly with the tight cord as it would have with a knife. The killers then stretched out the governor's scalp, pinned it to a wooden board, and paraded with it through the streets of Taos. By the end of that first terrifying day, the mob would track down and kill each of the other members of Governor Bent unfortunate party. They killed the sheriff on the roof of his house. They captured James Leal, stripped him of all of his clothes and spent hours torturing him. Blind and barely alive, they finally threw him into a ditch where he was eaten by hogs. Even the two teenagers didn't escape the mob's wrath. Tipped off by an Indian servant, the crowd found the pair hiding under a pile of straw in a barn. Setting upon the innocent teens, they thrust their lances into the straw until the boys were nothing but a mangled heap of flesh. The violence then quickly rippled out from Taos and engulfed other nearby towns. Eight American travelers were murdered in a town called Mora, just 40 miles to the southeast. Nine more found themselves surrounded by hundreds of Pueblo Indians who had tracked them to a distillery. After a long, drawn-out siege, two of the nine managed to escape in the darkness of night. The rest were killed. All told, at least 17 Americans died at the hands of the mob during the first day of the revolt. Back in Santa Fe, Colonel Sterling Price, who had helped Governor Bent run the territory, learned about the revolt two days after it started. When he heard that the rebels were heading south towards his location, he decided to head them off. He gathered a group of 400 men and four mountain howitzers and set off northwards to block the enemy forces, which had now grown to over a thousand men. 
Heading northward, the soldiers traveled for miles across snowy hills, fighting the rebels in fierce skirmishes. All along the route, the ground was frozen, and many of the soldiers developed frostbite. As the Americans trudged through deep snow, their blood boiled with the thought of their slaughtered countrymen. Eventually, they pushed the rebels all the way back to Taos, where most of them barricaded themselves in the old mission church of St. Jerome. The church of St. Jerome was an imposing building that towered over the rest of the town. Built by the Spanish in 1627, it was as much a fortress as a church, built to withstand the assaults of raiding Indian tribes. Now, however, it was the Pueblo Indians who took refuge in the towering structure they stuck their guns through holes they had punched into the thick adobe walls. Then they waited for the Americans to arrive. When Sterling Price showed up, he first brought out his howitzers and commenced a barrage that lasted for over two hours. As the smoke cleared, however, it became clear that the howitzers' shells were having little effect on the impenetrable exterior of the building. So Price then sent one of his captains to take a company and attack the walls with axes and hatchets. Sprinting through the lethal fire of the rebel defenders, they managed to make it to the foot of the church but their weapons were no match for the hardened mud bricks of the church walls. The captain then decided to circle the building and break in through the front door. But as he struggled to make his way to the front of the church, one of the rebels shot him and he went down. Seeing this, the rest of his men took up their axes once more and poured all of their energy into hacking through the solid walls that faced them. Finally, a small hole emerged, and with a well-directed howitzer shell, the church wall was blown wide open. Price fired several more howitzer shells at the opening before charging forward into the church. As the Americans rushed in, they found a horrifying scene of charred and mangled corpses, which had been ripped apart by the shells of the howitzers. Ignoring the thick smoke and the smell of burning flesh and blood, the soldiers spread out through the pews, slaughtering the remaining survivors. Outside, another group of soldiers waited in the foothills, shooting down any Pueblo Indians who attempted to escape on foot. The fighting in Taos lasted two more days, at which point the revolt was finally put down. By the end of it, more than 200 Pueblo Indians had been killed. But that wasn't the end of the events surrounding the Taos revolt. That spring, several accused Pueblo Indians were tried in a court that was heavily stacked against them. The trials were presided over by a judge whose son had been one of the murdered teenagers. Many of the jury members were similarly either relatives of the murdered teenager, the sheriff, or Charles Bent. All told, 17 death sentences were handed down during the trials. Although many of the convicted Pueblos acknowledged their guilt, there were many others who viewed the trials with suspicion. After all, the Pueblo Indians were being charged with treason during a time when their country was at war with the United States. Was it really treason to defend your homeland? One American witness may have summed it up best when he wrote, it certainly did appear to be a great assumption on the part of the Americans to conquer a country and then arraign the revolting inhabitants for treason. American judges sat on the bench, New Mexicans and Americans filled the jury box, and an American soldiery guarded the halls. Verily, a strange mixture of violence and justice, a strange middle ground between the martial and common law. Indeed, that strange mixture of violence and justice was part and parcel of a New Mexico that was still struggling to define itself in the 1840s, in a region where trade, cooperation and brotherhood went hand in hand with prejudice, greed and murder. Morality and justice could be hard to define. Were the Pueblo Indian rebels vicious murderers or martyred warriors defending their community? Those thoughts may have been going through the minds of some of the New Mexicans who witnessed what became Taos's first public hangings. As the first convicted men were raised up onto a wooden plank and secured with heavy nooses around their necks, they bid each other adios before dropping to their deaths. The Pueblo Revolt of 1847 was over, but the memory of those events would linger for generations, adding another chapter to New Mexico's fascinating and bloody history.